Kutaki no Ha, episode 26, Monday, August 28th, 2006. Welcome to Kutaki no Ha, the podcast dedicated to the Bujinkan martial arts of Masaki Hatsumi Soke and to the spirit of cooperation and friendship in the Bujinkan community. I'm Sean, your host for the podcast. It's now the last week of August, and summer is still pretty much full in swing here in Japan, although it's not uh, nearly as hot as it has been the last couple weeks. I meant to get this episode out last week, but uh, as usual, some things came up and delayed it a bit. But uh, we're back this week. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for downloading. And got a pretty good episode here for number 26. We have some interesting uh, rap music to start off with. And then we're going to get into a discussion on the reasons for training, where I'm going to make an argument that doing martial arts is not worth the time and money if you're only training to be able to protect yourself on the street. Uh, That might sound a bit controversial, and, well, maybe it is. I like to be controversial sometimes and stir up some discussion and thinking. So we're going to have a little bit of a discussion about that. And following that, we're going to look at some uh, events from the Kotaki event calendar on the Kotaki website at www.kotaki.org. I'm going to plug a couple of the events that are listed on there. Rob Brenner's back with uh, his training segment. And this episode, he's going to be talking about strength exercises. And then... uh, after that, we'll be wrapping up the episode with some music by Rachel Kahn. Saturday, August 29th, was a very, very hot Saturday afternoon in Japan, and it was so humid. And uh, after training, I, I came home and I was doing some computer work and stuff and was just completely drenched in, in sweat because it was so humid and a uh, I'm too cheap to turn on the air conditioning because it leads to such high electric bills, so I was trying my best to just put up with it with the fan I had, but in the end I did give up and went to turn on the air conditioning, but in the meantime, uh, some rhymes had started to kind of congeal in my head and just went with it and started to type out some stuff, and a few hours later I had produced what could be called a song, I suppose, but uh, I'm going to torture you guys with that now, so it's a bit corny, but here you go. I slowly gain awareness of an enigmatic sound. It's my sweat hitting the floor and dripping down and all around me as I sit here trying to come up with a plan for keeping cool. The summer has me enslaved as a sticky, sweating fool. I could get up in a second and go flip on the AC. Anything to give some relief from this damn humidity. But it's too much work to get up, so I struggle to ignore the sticky summer heat that wrenches open every pore. Body. 
wondering how not to be wet when the sticky, mucky air kickstarts another auto sweat. I could get up in a second and go flip on the AC. Anything to get some relief from this damned humidity. But it's too much work to get up, so I struggle to ignore the sticky summer heat that wrenches open every pore. So you could take out your earplugs now if you just couldn't stand getting through that. Uh, it's kind of my ode to summer, and the Japanese summers are extremely hot and humid. And myself, being from Canada, finds the humidity just a little bit too much sometimes. And so maybe you could call that little spiel a kind of like heat stroke lapse or something like that. Anyway, the next thing that we're going to have on this episode is a discussion about the reasons for training. And I'm going to make an argument that doing martial arts is not worth the time and money if you are only training to be able to protect yourself on the street. One of the things that, that I've really enjoyed about training in Japan is um, how a lot of the teachers focus on different aspects of training and focus on the fact that training is, is for life and everyday life and not only for just kind of becoming a tough guy or beating somebody up on the street. And also not only even for just simply defending yourself in a physical encounter. There was a discussion on the Kutaki forums recently uh, which brought up a couple of points and so I want to take uh, quotes from a couple of posts that were made. One person had said, how much time do you spend in the dojo learning about relationships, business, finance, health and politics? If your goal is better relationships, business, finance, health and political knowledge, Aren't there better venues for learning this than a dojo? The dojo is for the martial part of the martial arts. So this person was making an argument for the fact that, that the dojo is for learning physical martial arts that are used for physically attacking somebody or defending yourself in, in a physical confrontation. And in another post, uh, I think it was in the same thread but maybe a couple pages apart, Charles Daniel had made a point that I thought was was very good kind of in, in opposition to the first one. And if I can quote him here, he says, Recently this site has had a thread dealing with how do you know what you train in works? And while I guess such discussions are useful, I also think they miss a lot of what is important. Let's face it, in a day of easily obtainable firearms, the skill of unarmed fighting can't be the central reason for training. If it is, then you either need some serious work on your social skills or you are extremely unlucky. Fights are generally easy to avoid, and the odds of being selected out of the crowd are slim to none. Sure, it happens, but not very often. So, while you may find yourself in a situation where you need your obotegyaku, the odds of it happening in the adult world are small. So that said, if we are not learning to fight to save our skins from the next badass on the block, what are we doing? Unquote. And uh, I thought Charles, Mr. Daniel here, had made uh, a really good point in kind of drawing our attention to the fact that there are other reasons for training other than just trying to kind of save our skins on the street or, or things like this. And uh, although the Bujinkan is quite popular with the police and military personnel who put, their, put themselves at, at physical risk much more than the average Joe does, as far as the Bujinkan membership, probably the majority of the members in the Bujinkan are not in uh, police or military roles. They're more kind of like uh, everyday people with everyday jobs who don't normally find themselves in a situation where they have to uh, physically fight for their own safety or, or try to save themselves from being killed or, or badly injured on the street. So one of the things that I hear a lot in the dojo over here is how the concept of, of training can be applied to 
relationships and business and this kind of thing and how the principles of distance and timing and balance can be used in everyday situations. And uh, as kind of like uh, fuel for the point that I'm trying to make here, I had a look at the violent crime statistics on the U.S. Department of Justice government webpage, and that's at www.ojp.usdoj.gov. And I was looking at their their latest uh, crime statistics, uh, which were for 2004, and their violent crime statistics in 2004, there were 21 occurrences uh, per 1,000 people. And this is for the whole this is for the whole U.S. altogether. Uh, I realize there are there are safe parts and dangerous parts in the U.S. and not everywhere is the same. But taking the whole country as an average, and and just the U.S. as as one example, uh, it looks like 21 occurrences of violent crime per 1,000 people in the population. So if you're an everyday citizen in the United States you have a 2.1% chance of being involved in a violent crime of any kind. That's any kind of, of violent crime that's reported that they that they categorize. They have a separate uh, column there for, for homicide or murder, and the, the rates for murder in 2004 were 0 0.1 per 1,000 people. So basically, if you're a normal Joe living in the U.S., on average, you have a 1 in 10,000 chance of being murdered. And the statistics showed the the rates for these violent crimes and, and homicide and different kinds of violent crime since like 1970 all the way down through 2004. And basically, 2004, the crime rate has been steadily falling and 2004 has been like the lowest rate for I forget exactly what it was now, but it's for a long time. So actually, the the crime, the violent crime rate in the U.S. has been steadily falling for quite a number of years. So the chances of being involved in a violent crime or the chances of of somebody killing you in the U.S. these days is actually quite low and getting lower. So compared to the chance of being injured or killed in another situation where you can't do anything to prevent it like uh, car accidents, sporting accidents, uh, there's illness or disease which is, could also debilitate you. These kind of things also come into play and you're probably, you know, actually more likely to be injured, say, in a car accident or, or some other thing that happens in daily life than you are to be injured in a crime on the street. And I don't know what the uh, rates of fatality, for example, in, in automobile accidents or other kind of um, sporting or recreational accidents and this kind of thing are. But uh, I'd be interested to see what the chances are of the average person, say, dying in a car accident or being hit by another car or in some kind of um, sporting accident or something like that compared to the chance of being killed or murdered on the street. And we often talk about how the Bujinkan is, is very effective for real-life situations and how we have to we have to train to be realistic and we have to train to protect ourselves against somebody that's really trying to kill us. And while yes that is extremely important, uh the statistics show that the chances of somebody actually trying to seriously injure you or kill you are are quite low. So what are we really training for? Okay. So then let's look at the the amount of time and money that a lot of people put into their training. And uh, I don't really know the average cost of training, say, in the U.S. Uh, where I came from in Canada, the, the average dojo was charging around 50 to $60 per month uh, for training. And they would have two to three classes a week of two hours each. So if you're, if you're paying $50 a month for training, there's 12 months in a year, that's $600 a year that you're, that you're paying for martial arts training. And as far as time goes, if you're training two hours in a class and you go to two classes a week and you train 50 weeks out of the year, there's 200 hours a year. So every year you are spending $600 and 200 hours of your time for martial arts training. And if you're doing that to prevent yourself against a violent crime or prevent yourself against a chance of being killed on the street, I mean, you're spending a lot of money and a lot of time in the for the prospect of trying to 
defend yourself or prevent something which actually has a very low chance of happening. If you go on and train for five years, then at those rates you have spent $3,000 and 1,000 hours on training. Not including the cost of going to seminars or going to Japan or even the cost of gasoline or bus fare to your local training location or any other special kind of training event or training equipment, your dogi, tabi, whatever. So think, think about it. If you went out on the street, okay, what are the chances of, of being violently assaulted and, say, having your money stolen? Well, okay, the chances are quite low, and even if that does happen, most people are carrying a lot less than $3,000 on their person. So even if you do get, say, mugged and beaten up, you're still most likely to lose much less money than you have invested in your training. And if you hadn't been training at all, you know, the hospital, say you say you got, like, violently assaulted and you got uh, uh, a couple b- bones in your face broken and a couple of teeth knocked out, I mean, you're probably still going to spend less than $3,000 and 1,000 hours in recuperation time. So even if you don't do any martial arts and you you walk around on the street and you happen to be in the 2.1% that has something violent like this happen to them, you are still going to spend less time and money in recuperation from that than you would have spent in five years of martial arts training. Okay, So you'd still be better off financially and as far as use of time goes if you had not done any martial arts training. Okay, And even if you do do martial arts training, there's still no guarantee that you won't be injured or killed if you are in the 2.1% that uh, is involved in a violent crime or if you're in the 1 in 10,000 that is in a situation where you can be killed. Martial arts training like improves the odds of surviving and doing well in that rare situation, but it's still no guarantee. So even if you're doing martial arts and you've done martial arts for a long time, there's still no guarantee that you're going to come out any better in a violent crime or a, like murder situation than somebody who doesn't. So it makes much more sense to train in martial arts with the intention of being able to apply the lessons of the dojo to everyday life situations such as relationships, business, finance, health, and that kind of thing than it does to train in martial arts with the sole intention of being able to protect yourself in a street situation. That's the statement that I want to make and those are kind of like some figures and facts to kind of back up my argument. If you'd like to state uh, your opinion on this kind of thing, you can send me an email at koryu at kotaki.org, K-O-U-R-Y-U-U at kotaki.org, or drop me a PM through the website, and uh, we can maybe discuss your comments on this in the next episode or upcoming episodes. But for now, I just wanted to try to make a point and hopefully stimulate some discussion and thought on that topic. So next, at this time, we're going to look at some events that are on the Kutaki event calendar. We're going to plug a couple of events listed there. The first one is the Ninja Summit. It's actually taken place this past weekend, and uh, the location is in Richmond, Virginia. It's put on by the Bujinkan Shima Dojo, and Doug Tweedy is the contact person for that. And he quotes, We have been extraordinarily lucky to have nine instructors volunteer their time and incredible skills to this charitable event. As in past years, this event is to raise money for cancer research and charity. Please check out www.rvabujinkan.com and click on the 2006 Ninja Summit in the navigation bar for instructor bios, costs, and methods of payment, as well as more details. Thanks for your support in this fundraiser to help fight an illness that has touched so many lives and families of our fellow Buyu. I look forward to seeing many new and old faces this year. Thanks, Doug Tweedy. So that has been this past weekend. Friday the 25th of August through Sunday the 27th of August. I hope everyone there had a great time and and learned a lot of great things. And it's really great when Buyu can raise money for charitable causes such as cancer, this kind of thing. The next event that we're going to look at is an upcoming event that's going to be held on the 10th of September. And this is a third annual 9-11 fundraiser. And the contact is Mark Guest at the Bujinkan Bruin Dojo, which is bbdojo.com. This will be the third fundraising event to raise money for the Bear Search and Rescue Foundation. We have raised $3,500 to date. 
Guest instructors include Jack Hoban, Matt Hildreth, Mark Davis, Mark Guest. The theme, as always, Budo in the 21st Century and the Principles of Warriorship. And that is $100 for the one day. It's just one day, Sunday, the September 10th. And so check bbdojo.com for more information on that. It's time now for Rob's training segment. And this episode, he's going to be talking to us about strength training. So thanks in advance, Rob. And here you go. Hello, I'm Rob Brenner. And welcome to the training segment of the Kutaki Nuha podcast. Today we're going to focus on strength training exercises for Budo Taijutsu. In the past training segments, we were talking about the phases of moving through a technique or receiving impact. Today we're going to talk about preparing you for the requirements of Budo Taijutsu. We're going to move from general preparation to specific uh, preparation, allowing you to go from just getting yourself in shape so you can show up to improving the actual movements and techniques found in Budo Taijutsu. Now, having said that, remember it's your responsibility to be aware of your own health and your own safety. So when doing these exercises, know your level of conditioning before you start. Don't try to do too much. Don't injure yourself. Remember, the goal of training in martial arts is self-protection. And part of that self-protection is your own health. So let's think about the four main parts of doing an exercise. We have joint mobility, joint strengthening, muscle strengthening, and muscle flexibility. In the joint mobility, that's first and foremost. Most people think stretching is the most important thing we can do for martial arts. And when we mention stretching, the image most people have is someone sitting in the splits trying to increase the flexibility of their inner thigh muscles. That type of stretching, generally called static stretching, is designed to increase the length of the muscle. It's not specifically designed to increase your range of motion in your hips. Now since we're doing a combat martial art, we find ourselves in odd positions and putting our bodies in weird shapes all the time. We need to have the greatest range of motion in all our joints. And that comes from joint mobility exercises. Joint mobility exercises, for example, are swinging your arms around in a circle not so fast that it's momentum moving it, but that your muscles are moving it so that you attain the free and natural use of each one of your joints the way nature designed it. When you achieve joint mobility, you'll find that your muscle flexibility has increased. There is a mechanism in your body, uh, throughout your body actually, that protects you from being able to stretch your muscles too far because of fear of ripping it. This is called the stretch reflex. And by increasing your joint mobility, you'll automatically increase the length of your stretch reflex. Second is strengthening the joints. So if we use the analogy of swinging our arms in a circle, different circular patterns, to increase our shoulder flexibility and our shoulder mobility, now if we held a weight in our hand while we did those same circles, we're going to strengthen the tendons and ligaments surrounding the joint given us an extra layer of protection and safety when we're doing Budo Taijutsu. After that, we'd want to increase the muscular strength of our shoulder. And for that purposes, we want to increase the extreme ranges of our mobility. Uh, for example, many people are familiar with the bench press. In the bench press, you're using the middle range of your flexibility. Almost everyone can put their hands on their chest and then stretch them out to full length. But when you start taking your arms and moving them back behind the plane of your shoulders, that's where the flexibility issue starts coming into play. That's your extreme range of motion. You want to be able to increase your strength in your extreme range of motion. This will give you an additional safety barrier to injuring yourself. You're still going to do most of your motions throughout your life in the middle of your range of motion. But the greater your effective range of motion is, the greater your middle range or your sweet spot will be, which is going to give you more choices when you're performing your taijutsu. Lastly is muscular stretching. This is generally thought of as <coughs> when we sit down in the splits, of course, and, and we're doing our static stretching. This is important because it will reset the stretch reflex length also. 
and give you greater ability to put your body in different positions. But what most people don't realize is that joint mobility, joint strengthening, and muscle strengthening will give you added flexibility. In fact, a lot of people don't know this, bodybuilders tend to be very, very flexible. Although you hear rumors that they can't move at all, there's many bodybuilders that can perform full splits at body weights of 300 pounds and very low body fat. So using strength, joint mobility, and joint strengthening to increase your flexibility is by far a better method because it's designed to be done while you're moving. And Taijutsu is a moving art. So keep that in mind in terms of the four main components of an exercise program. Now let's talk about the exercises. In Budo Taijutsu, most of our techniques are performed utilizing the strength of the hips and the leg muscles. That includes the ankles and knees and calves and everything from the waist down. That's where the power is generated from. So these exercises we're going to talk about today are specifically designed to strengthen those. A couple of the components of Bujinkan Buddha Tai Jitsu that we want to attain or capabilities we want to attain is the effortless movement from Kamai to Kamai or from standing erect to being on the ground, being able to shift and move effortlessly that way. We also want to have a greater kinesthetic awareness, that is, an awareness of where our bodies are in relation to our opponents, in relation to the ground, where our arms are in relation to our head, and so on and so forth. So that's kinesthetic awareness and proprioception. These are the things we want to increase. So for the first exercise, what we're going to do is we're going to stand in Shizen in a well-balanced Kamai that's head over shoulders, over hips, over heels. And we're going to squat down, keeping our spine perpendicular to the ground. With our spine perpendicular to the ground and our head balanced above our body, we're going to begin the movement with our knees. We're going to let our knees slide out so that our butt stays tucked under our hips. And we're going to squat down. The full range of this will be going all the way down till the backs of your thighs come into contact with your calves. And the stored elastic tension in your knee joints and in your hips will keep you in place. You'll be on the balls of your feet and your toes at this point. Your heels will have risen up off the ground. And that's okay because you'll find that your heels are still located under your hips, which are under your shoulders, which is under your head. Since many of us come into the Bujikan from different backgrounds and at different points in our life, we're not all going to have the physical conditioning to be able to go down to this deep of a squat at the beginning. I'm going to recommend you do 10 repetitions of this, if you can, three sets of 10 repetitions. You're going to go down as far as you can comfortably go. Now, understand the difference between discomfort and pain from injury. You're going to have some discomfort when you're beginning an exercise program. It's up to you to determine the level of preventing from going into pain. So, remember, you want to have some discomfort. You don't want to injure yourself. It's up to you to monitor that. For those of you that can go into the full squat all the way down, there's an advanced level from this. From here, we're going to move. Now, remember, you're fully squatted. You're on the balls of your feet and your toes. Your head is looking forward. I'm going to give you a little tool here that will help you, too, in this squat. And that's a trick that dancers and gymnasts use called spotting. In spotting, you pick an object or uh, some kind of marker, maybe on the wall in front of you, and you keep your eyes on it while you perform the movement. This will prevent your head from coming forward and throwing you off balance. It will also allow you to concentrate on the feel of doing the movement. And since the goal of Budo Taijutsu is to capture the feeling, we want to capture the feel of this movement. So use spotting as a method to keep your spine erect and your head over your shoulders. Now, from the deeply squatted position, we're going to allow our hips to travel forward and our knees to come into contact with the ground slowly and smoothly. You don't want to bang your patella into the hard wood of the floor or the concrete or wherever you're training on. You want to glide your knees to the ground, allowing your hips to rock forward. Your head's going to stay in place. The feeling behind this is that you're moving your body essentially around your head. Not all the way around, but your head stays in place and your body moves around. So from the deeply squatted position, shift your hips forward. This is going to require some flexibility in your hips, and you'll be developing it by doing the movement and let your knees come into contact with the ground. You'll find that the arches of your feet are in a 
very stretched position. This is going to increase the flexibility of your feet. Be careful. You don't want to go too fast or too hard here because you can create a small tear in the tendons and muscles under your feet. Now, shift your hips back. Don't lean your head forward here, but utilizing your thigh and your hip muscles, raise your hips up just a tiny bit and slide them back so that you come into the bottom of the squat position and then stand straight up again. This would be a full rep of the exercise. When you can do this full rep, you'll find that you have the ability to go to the ground and back up quite effortlessly. The second exercise is going to involve rolling and coming back up to a standing position. So we're going to start once again in our Shizen Kamai and we're going to squat down, but this time instead of coming up into the balls of our feet, we're going to lead this squat with our hips by shifting our hips backward and we're going to go down keeping our feet flat on the ground. This is going to be a little more challenging as it requires greater flexibility in the hips and greater flexibility in your knee joints. So start the movement, once again spotting an object in front of you. Squat down beginning with your hips and let the movement take you all the way down to a full squat with your feet planted flat on the floor. You're probably going to have to have your arms out in front of you for balance to begin with. And that's the bottom portion of the squat. For those of you that can do this, from here you're going to go ahead and rock back, setting your butt down on the ground, and allow yourself to go into a back roll. You're going to roll all the way back until you're in the position of Seiza that we practiced in the first exercise. From there you're going to use the same movement to stand straight up. One of the objects here is that you're going to go straight down, keeping your spine perpendicular as far as you can go. Then trying to keep yourself as low to the ground as possible, you complete your roll. Stay as low to the ground as possible until your spine, once again, is perpendicular to the ground. Then you come up out of the squat. This is going to strengthen all the muscles through your legs and hip and also teach you the correct timing and position for your rolling. Now that you've stood up and you're in the back position, squat down again utilizing the, the first type of squat that we used going onto our knees. And then from there, you can do a forward roll coming up onto your heels and stand straight up with a flat-footed squat. Now, of course, with variation, you can do all different types of these squats. You can roll in different directions. You can do side rolls out of the, the squats. You can do forward rolls, diagonal rolls, whatever you want. But for the basic concept, you understand that we're starting in Shizen, squatting down as far as we can go, rolling until we come into an aligned come I again and then standing straight up, utilizing the muscles of the hips and legs. For those of you that find that this is a fairly easy uh, exercise to perform, just try adding variations to it. Hold weights in your hand, hold dumbbells in your hand while you perform it, uh, hold weapons in your hand to add to the complexity. Then another way to add complexity and really challenge yourself in this third exercise is to begin standing on one foot. So you're in Shizen, lift one leg up off the ground, hold it straight out in front of you. Squat down. This is commonly called a pistol in the strength training circles. Squat all the way down. From there, lower your butt to the ground. Do your back roll. And this time, instead of going into your knees and back, you're just going to go to your shoulders, laying flat on the ground, and let your feet come down into a stretch behind you. So essentially you can either do a what's called a pike where your feet are together and you touch them on the ground behind your head or a straddle where your feet are separated and you touch them on the ground behind your head. So from the straddle you're going to roll back up and once again place only one foot flat on the ground, the other one stretched out in front of you and stand up with one leg. So it's a, in essence you're doing a pistol down to the ground, rock back allowing your feet to touch the ground behind your head, rock back up into a one-legged pistol coming up. This will greatly strengthen your legs and improve your balance and coordination dramatically. If all of this seems to be too easy for you to do, send me an email at mindrinse at gmail.com or PM me at the Kotaki website and I will add some challenging uh, variations to these exercises. Uh, as always, have great training. Contact me if you have any questions or concerns or any great information you want to share. And I thank all of you who have sent me the emails that you have and uh, how your training has progressed. 
And uh, once again, uh, my name is Rob Brenner, and I will talk to you next time. Thanks very much, Rob. I hope everyone's been enjoying Rob's training segment. I think it's added a lot to the show. And I also want to thank everyone who actually went and voted at podcastalley.com. I was really uh, pathetic in my plea for votes in the last episode, but it actually does seem to have worked. On August the 17th, we had eight votes for August so far. At that point, on the 17th of August, we had received eight votes, and we were in 376th place on podcastalley.com. Okay? Then... Five days later, just after I put out episode 25, we had 11 votes. So three people voted between August 17th and August 22nd, and that brought us from 376th place to 325th place. So three votes jumped us like, how many? 51 positions, okay? And now it is six days later on August 28th, and we have three more votes, So now we have 14 votes for August, and that has put us down below the 300 mark. We are now today at 292nd place. So we did crack 300, as I was pathetically pleading for in the last show, uh, through only six votes. So every vote actually makes a huge difference, and uh, it's great if people can take a couple seconds and pop over to podcastalley.com and give a vote for the show. There is a link directly to the voting page from the Kotaki podcast page, which is located at www.kotaki.org slash podblog. And for people that don't uh, subscribe via iTunes or or can't for whatever reason, you can listen directly to the episodes through the Flash player that is located in the show notes of each episode at that page. Thanks to everyone also for participating in the forums at www. Kotaki.org. We have a great community going, and I hope that it continues to be a good place for people to come and learn more and get information about what's going on around them in the Bujinkan community. So uh, the vote plea is out of the way, and all of the material for this episode is out of the way, so that means we must be coming close to the end of episode 26. I'm going to leave you with a song by Rachel Khan. It's called Montana de Oro Alternate Mix. I really like her music, and I will be placing a link to her page on podshow.com in the show notes at www.kotaki.org slash podblog. So check out her music on her page there if you like it. That's all I have, so see you next time in episode 27, probably the first or second week of September. Jane.
in clemency. We are the girls exquisite in our comprehension of excruciate. We spill love. We are leaking transmissions from each duct yet for every breath we ponder reversing for every moment. Insurmountable we are tenfold beholden grateful awestruck at the vast and delicate delectation of this particular and precious and tenuous existence we are bursting at the seams innocent criminals teeming with rubies we make way any Helena will tell you Consider the orchid amputated and atrophying in glass. Note the skinned blood ball of discarded mink. It is the nature of our species to destroy what it desires, to consume, to violate and take what it deems beauty. We are the girls trapped in concrete, only knowing there is a snow globe inside, a memory floating in grace, a place where the bottom of the sea has heaved its own tectonics and nudged up through the surface of the earth in all its sedimentary splendor. It is triumph despite the unbearable gravity of being. We make way with pocketfuls of shiny shards, with palmfuls of Question marks with bellyfuls of crackling chrysalis glistening, glittering. <laughs> <laughs>